Hello, and welcome to Women in Business, where we interview entrepreneurs and senior managers and show you the strengths, successes, obstacles, and roadblocks women experience in business. Since I believe every person in business needs to be visible, I'd like to invite you to watch www.sob6, that's the number six, tips.com, which will give you some valuable information should you get the call to be on radio or TV, which I think is extremely important. If you'd like to contact me personally, drop me a line at Gail Carson, that's G-A-Y-L-E, Gail Carson 13 at gmail.com, or go to my website, www.spunkyoldbroad.com, and sign up for my weekly newsletter. I have a delightful guest today. Her name is Erin Trafford, and she is a digital visibility and story strategist. And she specializes in helping entrepreneurs and small businesses find and refine their path to revenue via story, visibility, and modern online sales strategies. And she's an award-winning journalist, a blogger, consultant, and strategist, and owns Erin Trafford, Inc., which encompasses two digital properties, DIYpassion.com, a six-figure lifestyle blog, and AaronTrafford.com, a coaching and consulting company. Welcome, Erin. We are just delighted to have you with us today. Thank you so much. I'm thrilled to be here with you. Well, uh, let's get right into what you do. So what is a story strategist, and how did you get started as one? Such a great question. So full disclosure, I gave myself my title because I actually didn't think it existed in the world. And I stumbled around for for quite some years calling myself different things. I was, you know, a content strategist. I was um, a media strategist. And then one day, and I, I had an experience, and, and we can go into detail about this if, if you'd like, Gail, but it really occurred to me that the sum total of everything I have done in my life and in my career really was pointing me toward uh, story being the center of everything I did. Um, it's the center of how I show up with my clients, how I help my clients show up in the world, uh, whether they're at the individual solopreneur level, they're small business owners, or at the corporate level. Um, and so I just decided to call myself a story strategist because it, it really just felt the best and it made the most sense. So that's how I became a story strategist, really. <laughs> you know, storytelling has really taken on a life of its own lately. And yeah. a lot of them are saying how important it is if you really want to, to get your message out is to tell a really good story. So you just said there's a difference between content strategy and story strategy. So what is that? Yeah, I'm so glad you asked that question because it's so often misunderstood. And it's something that I work with my clients on all the time is the story strategy, if, if, if I can kind of take a step back and say both are important, right? I'm not going to say you need one over the other. They're both parts of your marketing and branding pie. I use food analogies a lot. I love food. <laughs> so they're both part of the pie and they're equally as important. But story strategy, you can think of as a principle. It's this thing that you work to develop. And I like to say to my clients, it is essential in the sense that it is your essence. And it typically consists of the essence of your business or your company the essence of you, whether you're the leader or an executive or even just the sole operator in your business. And it really sets up a guiding principle for your business going forward. I live on the East Coast, so I often use the analogy of your story strategy is like your lighthouse. It never really moves and it doesn't really change and it can truly act as safety in a storm. So when you're confused or you're muddled or you're feeling a little bit unclear on what direction to go, go back to your story strategy and it will guide the way. Versus your content strategy, which is much more of a tactic. And I like to say your content strategy is only as strong as the platform it's built on. So that's where we look at things like your social media or you know the stages you are appearing on or the podcasts you are invited to speak on. 
that's part of your content strategy. And it's a tactic because it will ebb and flow with the strength of the platform you're on and the message you are pushing. The other key distinction, if, if I could, could make it, between story strategy and content strategy is that content strategy tends to be all about showing up glossy and perfect and really best foot forward. And it's where we spend a lot of time on beautiful graphics sometimes. And, you know, we're really, really getting into the nitty gritty of showing up in the best light. Whereas the story strategy often requires us to sit down and get really real with both sides of us, our life experience and our emotions and our strategies. It's much more of a dichotomy that plays on the, the light and the dark, the positive and the negative, the good experiences and the bad experiences and leverages those things to create unique value. So I like to call using that light and that dark um, the creation of positive tension. So your story strategy always has that positive tension a little element of grit and realness, whereas the content strategy tends to be a little more glossy. Did that? Well, you know, did that? There's another thing too, Erin. You know, in sales, they say facts tell and stories sell. So yes. I think that even even when you're giving a speech, you can make a point, but if you could back it up with a story, a real story that can reach the audience and they can identify with they're going to remember your message a lot better than if you just are giving them a lot of data. So I think, you know, you're, what you're talking about is so important because uh, I think it can set you apart if you want it to be. But um, <laughs> this, I'll tell you something, this next question really, um, I, I really want to get your take on this. And that's, do you have to be on social media every day to be visible? I mean, <laughs> I'm now I've gotten... The people want me on Clubhouse, and they want me on Boxer, and they want me, I mean, every day there's something else. I, I put in WhatsApp, and I had like four or five different groups um, uh, put me on WhatsApp, and they would, I mean, I got dinged all day, I mean, about absolutely silly things. And I just wonder how much social media is really important. Now, I know strategic Social media is important, but I just want to get your take on that. Yeah. Oh, I'm with you on that. That feeling of always being needed by somebody for something at some exact time, you know, looking at your phone and that causes that involuntary anxious feeling of, oh my goodness, all those notifications. So, so the short answer is no, you don't need to be on social media all the time in order to be visible. And I'll back that up by saying today is a Monday. Um, my team is building out our, you know, our new quarterly plan this week. We're in full, what I say, beast mode behind the scenes, pulling programs together, um, running cl clients through stuff. There's lots of stuff going on. And generally, you'd think that that would mean that I had to be everywhere on social media. And today, I just, I haven't been on social at all. I have just not shown up because, truthfully, I, I know right now that it's not going to impact my business in any way, shape or form for me to be on social. So that's one of the first questions and hesitations that my clients have is, oh my gosh, like I have to be everywhere all the time. And I say, no, you have to actually know what you're trying to get your story to do for you. And then strategically be discerning about what to tell and when to show up in order to achieve the objective you're looking for. So if you're going to sell Valentine's Day cards, there's no reason to be out there hustling for the sale in September, right? Like, and, and that's trivializing it. But the truth of the matter is social media is not the be all and the end all of your story or your content strategy. And it, it bothers me sometimes that that's where consultants and strategists tend to go um, all the time. It's, it's, it's an easy answer to say, well, just show up on social. And it's, it's not the only answer. Well, you also talk about a story map, and you talk about a content calendar. Now, I know that uh, people, you know, have marketing calendars, and I know that they have business plans, and they have all of these things, but tell us the difference between a story map and a content calendar. 
So one, just like we talk about overlaying your content strategy on top of your story strategy, one precedes the other. So I like to use the analogy of a story map because it's more flexible. When you think about getting in your car, I mean, we don't do this at all anymore. We use GPS, but it's kind of the same thing. You get in your car and let's pretend you want to drive from, you know, I grew up in Toronto. So let's say you want to drive from Toronto to New York City and you've got your map and you know your final destination. You can make decisions along the way. Are you going to take the scenic route? Are you going to stop off and go to a farmer's market? Are you going to, you know, pull off the highway so you can go to an amusement park? How are you going to make that journey from point A to point B more joyful? And how are you going to make it more uniquely you so that you have an experience that you want to have, right? Maybe you just want to gun it. You want to get right on the highway and go 110 miles an hour all the way from Toronto to New York and not stop and not do anything, right? That's up to you. But the fact is that the map shows you all the possibilities, right? Once you have that, if you want to create a content calendar and some sort of, you know, structure around your trip or your journey, that's fine. And that's where your, you know, your calendars, your social media planners can come in. But, but the map is so much more freeing. And the other thing, Gail, I've noticed is that when I talk about a map versus a calendar, it resonates more with my female clients. I think women inherently, we tend to be very creative. We don't like to be put in boxes and, and, and we have problems with feeling like, oh my goodness, I'm not following through. Like a, a calendar will feel very restrictive for a lot of people. So saying, you know what, it doesn't matter if you post something on a Tuesday, you can post it on a Wednesday and the world is not going to end to, to a lot of my clients that feeling of relief and freedom actually gives them permission to post where they wouldn't have normally posted or where they would have felt guilty or where they would have felt trapped a bit by the, all the shoulda, coulda, wouldas. And when we're trapped by the shoulda, coulda, wouldas, we're not showing up properly, right? We're not showing up in our full self. We're showing up hesitantly. We're lacking confidence. We're feeling a bit, you know, um, sidetracked by, energies that we don't really need. So, so that's truly, it's an energetic difference between a map and a calendar. Does that answer your question? Does that make sense to you? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, uh, you also mentioned something about having a story bank. Mm -hmm. And I know that um, sometimes I'll listen to old, well, now there are, I guess, CDs or DVDs or whatever, MP3s. But I listened to some of my old tapes and I think about some of the stories that I told and I thought, God, I forgot all about that. So uh, I'm assuming building a story bank is seeing something and putting it in some kind of a file for later use. But what is your definition of a story bank? It's, it's pretty much that. I mean, I, I use the term bank because when you put something in the bank, when you put money in the bank, the hope is, I mean, <laughs> that it's going to appreciate in value over time, right? So we, right. Collect our, we collect our stories. It's a very deliberate use of the term. So, so I work with my clients to pull out stories because, you know, Gail, you and I are, are TV people. We're radio people. We know stories. We know how to see them. We know how to tell them. But that's actually a skill that not a lot of people have. So when I sit with clients, a lot of them will say, I don't have a story to tell. I'm boring. I have nothing to talk about. And I'll say, give me three hours and I'll prove you wrong. And usually at the end of that three hours, we've created this, what's the beginning of the first deposits in their story bank. And, and, and they're like, oh my goodness, I have this wealth of story that I've been sitting on that I can leverage to build my business, to connect to people, to, as you mentioned before, create memory, right? <laughs> to be memorable, which is what leads to the sale. So the bank is something that, you know, I, I have it in a notebook because I like to sit with my tea in the morning and I like to write, you know, I follow some prompts, I'll write some stuff out and then I'll go back and I'll look at it for themes. And, and usually by the end of the week, a theme has appeared and that's really my, my signal to start telling stories that match that theme. And 99% of the time when I follow that gut instinct, I do what my story bank has told me to do, I'll attract new clients. Some of my clients will take it from a notebook and put it in a Google Doc. It doesn't really matter, and it doesn't have to be fancy. 
but what's important about the the story bank, just like the money bank, like like your, like the bank bank, is that you make continuous deposits. That it is a practice because telling stories, seeing stories, recognizing the value of your stories is something you, you can't just do it one and done. You have to actually commit to those regular deposits so that you see your value increase over time. And it is we know, an emotional it's experience. Only, it's not only the deposit there. And I mean, I know people, um, you know, speaker friends of mine who are absolute magnificent storytellers and they, they have a whole catalog, you know, that they, they keep under certain keywords. And when they're doing a program, and they're trying to make a particular point, they go to it and pull out the story that's appropriate. And the other thing that they do is, let's say that they're they're giving, you know, let's say they do a repeat engagement, or let's say they're booked for five speeches for the same company. They may, uh, they keep track of the stories they tell so they don't duplicate anything. And that's a real gift uh, mm -hmm. to, to be able to do something like that. I mean, I, I have good intentions of doing that, and sometimes I do and sometimes I don't. But, uh, I mean, people who are real storytellers, you know, and that's how they make their living uh, in the speeches that they give, uh, they they have a catalog of stories. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I love that you brought that up, too, because um, I, I like energetically thinking, too, a story is something that you can bank and it appreciates over time because you can see it, you can make it manifest from your mind and your experience to the page. But also every time you tell it, whether you're on a stage or you're on a podcast or whatever, it increases in value again because you are sharing it with other people who then make it part of their experience. And, and but, but your point about tracking it and uh, using it as a strategic piece is also very important. So I do that with my with my one on one clients is we do that keyword kind of breakdown. It's like, well, if you want to tell a story about this particular thing, you know, we dig in and we build that bank to prove that point and we make sure it ties to their business objectives. So, you know, if I'm working with someone who's, I don't know, a wardrobe consultant, let's say, you know, we're going to build stories around body image and confidence and maybe, you know, um, cleaning out your closet, like things like that, that a wardrobe consultant would need to have in her story bank so that when she goes out into the world at networking events or she's hosting web classes or she's just simply posting on Instagram, bang, there's a whole bunch of stories that she can call on that are very aligned to her, her voice, her experience that add value to her brand and feel easy for her to tell. That's the other thing for, for a lot of folks, they get stuck on the telling because it's scary. So the easier we can make it, the more natural it can be, the more in line with your life experience it can be, the easier that whole showing up and telling part will, will also be. You know, you are so enthusiastic and you're so animated. And I have to ask you this question. What was it like? <laughs> growing a baby and a business in 2021? <laughs> so, yeah, that, <laughs> that's a new question that can only be asked to me now. <laughs> um, so <laughs> what was it like? Um, so, yeah, I mean, I'm, I am a mom of two little girls. I have two now under the age of four. Um, and and it, I, was, I was pregnant um, when the pandemic really took hold. So I was just coming out of my first trimester. And, you know, if I'm being honest, just like most other businesses, it was like getting punched in the gut. It was like, okay, what are we going to do? And it wasn't so much that my business wasn't sustainable, but a lot of my clients had complete disarray in their businesses, you know, especially anyone in the travel industry or, you know, retail and, and a lot of things shifted. And I thought, what am I going to do? You know, I had big plans of taking a maternity leave and, and, and so on and so forth. Um, but I, and, and the real answer is, what was it like? It's like, I don't really know because I kind of just rolled with it. And I spent a lot of time thinking about um, how I needed, how the world needed me to be because I had no choice. I had this literal physical reminder that I was going to give birth, you know, in late July. 
Um, and, and that actually being pregnant in the pandemic is what made me recognize that I was a story strategist. It was like rubber meat in the road, no time to fool around. How, how is the world asking you to be? Um, so, so the pregnancy actually supercharged things for me. And I ended up in 2020 giving birth to a healthy, healthy baby girl. Um, my business tripled and I brought on two new team members and somehow in there, in the midst of all the pandemic, we also did a full scale kitchen renovation. So, you know, that's a year for the books for me. <laughs> and I don't know that I'll repeat it ever again. Um, but the lesson there really is to dial into your intuition and to release the parts of your business and your story that are not serving you, right? When you release all that extra baggage, you're able to propel forward no matter what the perceived challenge. Because uh, there really was a lot stacked against me last year, but I, I didn't let it stand in my way. Hold on a second. I think we lost Dr. Carson. I don't know what happened, but here I am. Okay. <laughs> Okay. Did did you get my whole answer? Did that no, all record? Got, yeah. Well, uh, Joe will pick it up. Uh, okay. Start from your uh, uh, your first trimester. Uh, okay. That's a good pickup. That's a good pickup. Okay. So I was in my blah, 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 three, two. So I was in my first trimester, Gail, when the pandemic really took hold, and like most other business owners, it was like getting punched in the gut. It was like, oh, this is not just going to be a two week thing. This is going to last a really long time. Um, and I had huge plans that I was going to take the summer off and be with the baby. And it was just going to be this whole thing. And my, my preschooler was going to, you know, stay home with me. Um, but I found myself with a lot of clients who were also very panicked. Uh, a lot of their businesses were falling apart. And Truly, if I can be honest with about how I handled 2020, um, being pregnant in a pandemic, growing my business, is that it, it caused me to reckon with myself about how I really wanted to show up in the world. So, so actually, it was like taking a dose of my own medicine. You know how it's like the cobbler's children always have the worst shoes? It was like I was telling all my other clients and teaching my clients how to show up in their story, and I had kind of been neglecting myself. So... That was the year when I decided I am not actually a content strategist. I'm more than that. I am a story strategist. I came out as that um, and things just picked up for my business. I mean, I, it was a challenge being pregnant. I'm not going to lie. Uh, but, you know, my baby was born healthy in the end of July. I took eight weeks off. I grew my team by two people. I tripled my business. Um, and somewhere in there in the fall, we also did a full scale renovation on our kitchen and I'm still married. And <laughs> so, I mean, like it was a crazy year that I don't care to repeat, but I think that the lesson there is truly when, when the world really feels like it's falling apart around you. And, and many times it did that year, it was, it's go back to your lighthouse, go back to your story strategy. Who do you really want to be and how are you really being called to show up and just do that? And when you, when you find your footing there, everything else unfolds. It became clear to me how to work with clients in a more effective way. It became clear to me what sort of stopgap programs I needed to offer to help my clients bridge the gaps that they were seeing that were being caused by the pandemic. It, it made me feel confident and clear that I was going to be able to move forward no matter what. Um, well, we, so, we're so, yeah. at the end of our program, Erin, so we're going to have to wrap this up. But I want to have you tell our audience how to get in touch with you. And folks, listen to what she has to say, because many of you are buying yourself a job when you go into business. Now, here Erin had a baby. She took eight weeks off. 
She increased her business. She hired more people. That's the way you build a business. So, Erin, give them your information. Yeah, I would love to have you get in touch if, if I have sparked a seed of interest at all. Um, you can visit my website, erintrafford.com. New website coming at the end of April. Very exciting. Um, and if you want to just have a chat, feel free to reach out to my team. It's team at erintrafford.com. And uh, we can find some space on the calendar to have a coffee chat. And um, that's Erin, E-R-I-N, Trafford, T-R-A-F-F-O-R-D. And uh, in, in, uh, also in terms of that, she is also giving you this wonderful gift. We're going to put the uh, uh, landing page up on our show notes. But it's, um, uh, it's a wonderful, wonderful gift that you have for her. I think it's called 77 Story Prompts. So, um, you know, it'll give you a chance to figure out what is it you want to say and how to say it. So uh, I just, I can't thank you enough, Erin. I mean, you've been a, a delight. And not only that, uh, you have shown people how you can have small children, you can get through a pandemic, you can build a business, you can take time off, you can increase your revenue, all of the good things that people say are impossible to do. So I, I commend you for that, and I think it's wonderful. And folks, hopefully you'll go to my website, spunkyoldbroad.com, see my program, see my, my store, see the rest of the shows that we have for you and all the other information. Lots of good stuff for, the, for you there as well. Erin, thank you so much for being with us today. I'm so appreciative of your time. Thanks for having me on, Gail. Thanks for listening to Women in Business. I hope you enjoyed today's show. And if you have any suggestions as to who you'd like me to have as a guest, just email me at gailcarson13 at gmail.com. Be sure to check out www.sob6tips.com. And in the meantime, go to www.spunkyoldbroad.com to see the resources I have for you.